Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bopes, and today's guest is integrative nutritionist and founder of Real Foodology, Courtney Swan. Courtney also hosts the Real Foodology podcast, which I was grateful to be a guest on. Today, we chat about Courtney's health transformation, what led to her unhealthy relationship with food, simple nutrition swaps people can make, her advice for parents, how she navigates life today, and more. So let's get this conversation going and welcome Courtney Swan to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Courtney, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Doug. How are you? I'm good. It's good to see you. I'm, good I'm to excited. See you too. To, I'm excited to chat with you. And I think one of the things that inspires me by a, a lot of people that are on the forefront of in the health and wellness space and trying to make a difference in other people's lives is when they've had their own like personal health journey and their own unhealthy relationship with food and they've kind of turned it around and not only turned it around, but are using that story to kind of help other people do the same. So like go back to like when you were a kid, I know like now you are like the face of nutrition. People look at your Instagram. They're like, Oh my gosh, like this girl is like, just knows all the things about everything, health and wellness, but it hasn't always been that way. So how has your relationship with food evolved since you were a kid to where you are now? Yeah. So when I was a kid, I actually was one of the lucky few whose parents were very on health my whole life. My mom made everything from scratch. I used to joke that she was uh, like Martha Stewart because, I mean, my mom would literally make pasta from scratch. She was making bread from scratch. And she was very on the nutrition side of things. Like we were shopping at this at the time when I was a kid, it was called Sun Harvest. And then it was later bought by Whole Foods. So it was our kind of like natural food store in our city. And I was very resistant of it. I had no idea how good I had it, as most kids don't, you know, because I would go to my, I will never forget this, my best friend, Katie, her pantry was just packed full of, you know, all of the junk food of our generation, like the Pop-Tarts and Dunkaroos. Dunkaroos were my favorite. Let's go. I love Dunkaroos. I saw them in 7-Eleven the other day and I was like, gosh, oh man, go on. I know, right? Like, to be honest, I kind of want to go just like try them just for nostalgia's sake. Because those were my favorite. And I wasn't allowed to have any of that stuff in the house. I was every once in a while, my mom would let me have a Coca Cola that she would like hide somewhere in her pantry. But she was very careful and meticulous about the foods that I ate. And so I had a, a huge wake up call when I went to college because, and just for people listening so they understand, I didn't really feel like that deprived. Like I would fight my parents a lot on that friend Katie that I mentioned. She would get Burger King like three or four nights a week for dinner. And I would fight my mom on things like that, but it's not like I was feeling like super deprived. And and now as an adult, knowing what I know about nutrition and especially how imperative it is for children and growing bodies, I'm so grateful that my mom was this way. So I go to college, I have a total wake up call. Um, You know, I'm eating in the cafeteria for every meal and it's, you know, Cisco, a lot of processed, just kind of crap. And I got introduced to the Taco Bell fourth meal that I was having after parties and, you know, going to keggers and drinking a lot of beer and safe to say I was very unhealthy. And I gained what people like to coin the freshman 15. And more importantly than the weight, I felt super fatigued, lethargic. I started getting acne, which I had never had when I was younger. And I was struggling with brain fog and it was just all these things. And, you know, it, it's, it's uncomfortable to put on a lot of weight in a very short amount of time. I mean, I would say I probably gained that 15 to 20 pounds within like a six month period. And it really opened my eyes up to just how important the foods are that we put in our body. And around the same time, my mom had started She was trying to be very subtle about it, but she started just like mailing me books about nutrition and she would cut out newspaper articles. I love my mom so much. She is so on top of stuff. Things that we are only now just talking about, like high fructose corn syrup and hydrogenated oils, which are known as trans fats. When I was in college and to put it in perspective, this would have been like 2004, 2005. My mom was cutting out newspaper articles about trans fats, about corn syrup, about Teflon. She made me get all stainless steel pots and pans because of the Teflon coated pans, which is a whole other conversation. And slowly I started to read the books that she was sending me. I took a nutrition course in college for my undergrad. And then I ended up years later going back and I got my master's in nutrition. But that kind of sparked my just 
my passion in the nutrition. And then, you know, I found people like Michael Pollan and Mark Hyman, and I started reading their books. And this was before, for people listening that aren't aware of Michael Pollan's work before the psychedelics, he was writing about our food industry. And that's really what sparked this passion for me. And then I was able to, you know, get my diet back on track. I lost the weight effort pretty like effortlessly once I started focusing on eating whole real foods in their natural states. And that is really what led me on this path of health. That's crazy. And you hear a lot about, they call it the forbidden fruit syndrome, right? Where you take away something from somebody and you tell somebody they can't have it. And then all of a sudden they they go off on their own and it's like a kid in a candy store. And they're like, oh my gosh, like, like you said, like pop tarts, candy, this and that, and they <laughs> yeah. end up going off the rails a little bit. And you see that a lot, I think with people with, with alcohol, specifically when kids go mm. off to college, when they, they grew up in a house where they weren't, there was no alcohol and there wasn't allowed to be, have any alcohol in the house, like all things go. Right. Yeah. And, and as you kind of look back, like as to why you started maybe like overindulging in the way that you did, do you think it was because it was uh, almost like an escape from what you had grown up with? Was it just part of the lifestyle and the, and the college you went to? Was it stress or do you just think it was just normal at that time? That's a great question. I think it was the combination of a couple different things. My parents were pretty strict on me when I was in the house. Like I always had a curfew. Even my senior year, I remember like all my friends no longer had curfews and I still had to come in at midnight and kiss my dad on the cheek, which was his way of trying to decipher whether or not I was drinking alcohol. So when I got to college, yeah, I think it was a combination of like defiance because I was like, oh yeah, well watch me. Now I'm going to eat all this fast food that I wasn't really allowed to eat in high school. And so, yeah, I think there was an element of like, haha, I, I can do it now because I'm an adult and making my own decisions. But also like genuinely looking back, I think part of it was just that all my friends were doing it and it tasted good. You know, like I remember I had mentioned the, the Taco Bell fourth meal. I had never really eaten. Like, I don't want to say I'd never ate fast food in high school, but it was very rare that I did. And so when I got to college, tasting Taco Bell and trying it, I was like, oh my God, this is so good. And not thinking about the detrimental effects that it would have on my body and the health and nutrition. Cause I just had, that had not clicked for me yet. So a lot of it too, was just, it felt good to be able to make these decisions and eat these things that were not allowed when I was in my house. So part of it, I think was just like part of the evolution of being like, I'm an adult. I can make these own decisions for myself and yeah, whether or not they were good for me. <laughs> What's really wild about this is a lot of times, like when, when people hit that point that you hit, like when you were in college and you started to gain the weight and you wanted to like dive in to your health, like a lot of people would have been even more defiant to their family members or their, their mom, like you said for you at that time, because people would say, well, it's all your fault. Like if you would have just let me like be a kid, I wouldn't be in this position or why do you have to be so obsessive with food or like, stop, like, leave me alone and just be my mom. Like, was there an aha moment where you looked at yourself in the mirror and you're like, you know what? Like, I just don't, I don't feel good about myself. I don't like the way I look. I don't like the way I feel. And I want to finally listen to my mom. Or was it something you started to kind of do on your own first? And then as you started to progress on your own, then like everything with your mom kind of came together. It was more the latter because in the beginning, I didn't really want to give my mom a lot of, a lot of credit, but now I give her all the credit because you know what really sparked it for me I have a very analytical brain. And what happened was my mom had sent me this one book that kind of changed the course of everything for me. It was called You Are What You Eat. I don't even know if it's still in print, to be honest. I think I, I think I still have it on my bookshelf too. And it just, in the most basic of ways, explained the very basic knowledge that you know that you and I have and that hopefully a lot of people have now about the food that we put in our body is literal food for our cells. And our body is constantly regenerating. We're constantly making new cells and our cells are what, you know, drive everything in our body and grow our hair and regenerate our skin and everything. And so I just, it was when I read that book was when everything, the puzzle pieces just kind of came together. And I had this aha moment of, oh my God, what I'm putting in my body directly affects my body. And it sounds so simple and it sounds so silly to say that, but this is one of the gripes that I have with our education system is that we are not teaching children in school this very basic, simple knowledge that what you put in your body is going to fuel your cells 
and it's going to affect the way your body looks. It's going to affect the way you feel. More importantly, it's going to affect your energy levels. And that was that book is what gave me that gift. And at the time, I didn't give my mom any credit. But like I said, now, like I sit on these podcasts and I say, oh my God, it was all my mom. Like my mom was, she led me to the the trough, if you will. And you mentioned that your behavior, I guess, in college and the way you kind of went off the rails with nutrition was in a way like some being defiant, like to your parents. And I think there's a lot of people that would have gotten to your position. Like I said, they would have maybe even gone further down that continuum. They could have gotten involved with things like drugs and alcohol or, and just gotten themselves into a variety of different things that could have gotten them in, in trouble. And I have a lot of like parents, a lot of moms who listen to my podcast and you've been on both sides. Like you've been on the side where you were that girl that was deprived of things that a lot of your other friends were having and things that you quote unquote thought were bad at the time for you to eat. And then now you're on the complete opposite end of the spectrum where you got your master's in nutrition, you've created a brand and a business on really educating people about like the importance of not eating certain foods and eating organic and this and that, like what can parents do other than modeling? Cause I know that modeling is important. What are some other like language? Like what are some things like, as you look back, that could have been done differently that maybe you wouldn't have felt so deprived and maybe a little bit more inspired or encouraged to make better choices? You know, I love this question. I think first and foremost, above everything else, it starts with communicating with your children. I have realized that looking back on my childhood, my parents tried to protect me from a lot of things, but we forget that kids are very intelligent from a very young age and they pretty much know what's going on from a very young age. So even like, I I just think about an example of, you know, my friend talks about how her parents were always fighting when she was a kid and they thought they were, you know, getting away with it because they're fighting behind closed doors, but it's like her and her siblings all knew, you know? So there's not really hiding a lot of, a lot of things from kids. So I think the most important thing to do is you just communicate as fully as you possibly can with your children because there's going to be no way that you can protect them from anything per se. I think your best defense in protecting them from the world, if you will, is being very honest with them about how the world works. And creating a communication line like that from an early age, I think will create that trust and confidence in your children to know that they can also come to their parents. Because I was very defiant and I ended up you know, sneaking behind my parents' backs a lot when I was a kid. I started drinking when I was 14. Thankfully, it didn't turn into anything like too crazy. It was just the classic like college drinking. And then I kind of got out of that phase. But looking back, all of the sneaking around, all the defiance, it was because my parents were never, they never created a a safe line of communication. They just kind of were like, we're the parents, you know, you do as we say, whether you like it or not. And then there was no sort of communication around like, Hey, well, we're doing this because, or we're really concerned about X, Y, and Z. And I think the communication is the most important thing. Yeah. Like healthy and effective communication, I think is so important for any kind of relationship. And I think it's even more important for like the parent child relationship. And I think it just, it can help with so many things. It can help with developing healthy coping mechanisms. It can help with absolutely developing like a healthy relationship with yourself and feeling loved, feeling heard, feeling wanted and all those things. And, and a lot of people, you see this, you know, I, I talked about this on your podcast with, with my story, how you go from like one extreme to the next with, when it comes to eating, where you go from just eating as unhealthy as you can. And then all of a sudden you just cut everything out and you go hundred percent like cold Turkey. And you say, I'm never going to eat any kind of processed food again, which in my opinion, I think can be a bit unhealthy for most people. What was your relationship yeah. with food and like your body and stuff like, you know, from the time where like you decided to make this change, you started reading all these health books. Like how did that progress to where you are now? You know, I had a lot of different iterations of my diets and my relationship with my body and my relationship with the exercise. So like looking back, it was kind of like a roller coaster. So it was like down for a while and then came back up and then went down again. And I would consider myself now back on the up again because I really, I pride myself on having a very healthy relationship with food now. But so when I first went to college and I'd gained a bunch of weight and I was desperate for answers, I was trying to figure out how to lose the weight. I was trying to figure out how to, you know, feel better in my body and get healthier. 
And I struggled for a couple of years because, you know, in the beginning, I was very new to all of this. I was just trying to learn everything I could about nutrition. And I'm glad I went the route I did because almost immediately it was like, you know, instead of trying to do the like, you know, the slim fast diets, which I tried very early on. And then I was like, wait, no, this is not the way I found nutrition, started doing that. Well, then what happened is I went plant-based and you and I actually talked a little bit about this on my podcast. I was vegetarian for five years. And then the last year I ended up eating fish. And for me personally, that was out of everything I've done with my health, it was the worst thing I could have ever done. Because then what happened was it gave me this false sense of that it was really working for me because I would say maybe the first year I had lost a ton of weight. So basically at that point I had lost all the weight I'd gained in college and it was effortlessly. Like I just, one day I was like, oh my God, how did I, I'm like so skinny from being vegetarian. And again, like I don't want to put emphasis on weight because that is not the importance here, but I'm just sharing what my experience was. And then from there, it all went downhill. And I, for some reason, I stayed on that diet for another four years. I dealt with the craziest fatigue. I was starving 24 seven. I mean, when I say starving, like I could not feel satisfied to save my life. And this was during the time when you have to imagine I was starting nutrition courses. I was reading all these books from experts. So, you know, I've heard there's a very famous line in the vegetarian community, vegan community that's oh, you just weren't vegetarian enough or you just weren't doing it right. I was doing everything I possibly could. And for me, it did not work. And this is a story for a lot of people. And this is not to say that a vegetarian and vegan diet doesn't work for everyone, but it is very, very hard to maintain because it's very carbohydrate heavy. And so, and then on top of that, I ended up with really severe hormonal imbalance. And I found out later in some of my nutrition courses, several of my professors told me that in their experience, every client they've ever had that was a woman that had a past of being vegetarian suffers from hormonal imbalances. And we don't really know exactly why that is, but there's something having to do with the nutrients and red meat that our body needs, especially when we're on our cycle and we're bleeding and we need to replenish our iron stores. Anyway, so I finally figured out that what was happening was my vegetarian diet and I figured out my hormonal imbalance and I was dealing with cystic acne that was aggressive for four years that would not go away until I started eating meat again. I finally got to a place where I had a vegetarian. Actually, this kind of reminds me a little bit of your story of your cellmate where he was just like, he didn't sugarcoat it. He just told you what needed to be said to your face. And I was sitting with this nutritionist and she looked me point blank in the eyes and she goes, you're sick and you're not going to get better until you start eating meat. And I remember I left that office sobbing. I told my mom she was a bitch and I couldn't believe that this woman told me that I had to eat meat. I was going to be vegetarian forever. My kids were going to be vegetarian, but I wasn't being honest with myself about how wait, sick wait, I you, was. You called your mom a bitch or you called this lady a bitch? No, the nutritionist, oh. not to her face, okay. not to her face behind her back. I was like, she's so mean. Like, I can't believe that she said that to me. Like I'm going to be vegetarian forever and it's the healthiest diet. Well, it took me a couple more, more months, but I woke up in the middle of the night <laughs> dreaming about eating chicken. And I literally was feeding my, like air feeding myself chicken. And at that point, I remember my mom was like, Courtney, your body is literally telling you that you need to eat meat. So that was the first iteration of my diet. And I will say the second I started eating meat, all the weight that I had gained in the last four years of being vegetarian completely fell off. I gained the energy back. I started feeling satisfied after meals. So that was like my first iteration. And, and all during this time, so while being vegetarian and vegan, I had a very unhealthy relationship with my body. I really, I hated my body. I felt like I was like 15 to 20 pounds heavier than, than I liked to be because I, I just felt heavy and lethargic and I didn't have the energy for really good workouts and I just couldn't get in a workout routine. And then I was beating myself in the gym, trying to go to these, you know, workout classes and whatever. And so then I started eating meat again. And then I was in a place for a while where I, for years was still just on this track of going to high intensity workout classes or doing these high intensity workout classes online and just completely beating myself to the ground. Sometimes I would do two workouts a day until I finally got to a point where I was like, I cannot do this anymore. Like this is a very unhealthy relationship with exercise because I would, you know, eat something that I deemed quote unquote unhealthy the night before. And then I would beat myself up in the gym the next day. Anyways, I finally got myself to a place about, I would say three years ago where I was like enough. 
I'm not doing any workout classes anymore. I'm saying no to all the high intensity exercises, which I find in general are pretty unhealthy for women because they raise our cortisol levels and our adrenaline. And if you're raising your adrenaline and your cortisol like that constantly on a day-to-day basis, it's really bad for our hormones over in our overall health. And I will say that when I stop doing those, I slim down around my waist, which is where we usually carry cortisol. Like that extra kind of belly fat is usually cortisol and, and stress hormones. And I was like, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm just going to go for a simple walk around my neighborhood every day. And that's turned into now every day, I just go for a, either a hike or a walk on the beach with my dog. And that's kind of where I'm at today as far as like my, oh, I could go into my diet that I have today, but that's kind of been my iteration of, of my exercise and, um, and food journey. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, it means a lot that you like felt comfortable enough to kind of open up and and share what you did. I guess I want to come back to like the red meat and the vegetarian diets. Cause I know like, I want to go into like how we can do better in the health and wellness space with not just like communicating with each other, but the the majority of the people that are freaking confused right now and like what to do. Do you think that that a lot of the way that you felt validated and felt loved, like by your mom specifically, was based around like how healthy you were and if you ate good food? So that I think like in your adulthood, you did you find yourself like continuing to to chase after that because you mm-hmm. kind of were taught as a kid that in order to be loved, like you need to be super healthy, you need to eat healthy, you need to look a certain way. Like, did any of that has any of that come up? You know, if I'm being honest, I've I've never really thought about it before, but I absolutely believe that there is somewhat of a connection there. Yes. Because I remember when I was in college and I had, like I had mentioned that I'd gained some weight and I came home and, you know, my parents made some comments and as concerned parents do, I don't want people listening, being like, oh my God, your parents are horrible. It was not like that. It was more that they were kind of like, oh, you know, like we're concerned because it seemed to have happened in, in, you know, a really quick amount of time. Anyways, and I I remember lashing out at the time being like, you're going to make me, you know, have an eating disorder. Like you can't say anything about my body and my weight and all this stuff. And, but yeah, like I did feel in a way a bit unlovable because my parents, my whole life, my parents have always, my whole family has always been really just, my family's just thin. We're all very tall. All of my aunts and uncles are like over six feet. My all my uncles are like six four. My dad's like six two. My mom is six feet. I'm six feet. And we're all just long and lanky. And so when I had gained all this weight, yeah, I guess I did kind of feel in a way like unlovable and I didn't fit in because all of a sudden, you know, I was heavier than everyone else and I was heavier I'd ever been in my whole life. And yeah, it, it definitely took its toll on me. You didn't think you were going to therapy today, did you? <laughs> no, but I love this. I'm very like. Yeah. I'm, I'm no. very into conversations like this. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm half kidding. And again, thank you so much for sharing that. And I guess like a lot of what happened there to me, just from hearing this a lot, it just seems like symptoms of like, all right, in order to like feel like loved or be myself or have approval from certain people, like I have to chase this certain thing for somebody else. And I think what happens is that cup gets emptier it gets empty quicker and quicker and quicker over time because you're like getting to the one place and it's like, I need more and more and more and more dopamine, more dopamine, more dopamine. And then eventually you just burn out. And you yeah. see that a lot with, with people that get like addicted to their bodies, addicted to exercise, addicted to, to not just food, but addicted to like eating healthy because their identity becomes so intertwined in that, that they feel if they like any kind of sidestep or if they fall off at all, that's people are going to think less of them. And I think a lot of it can go back to the, the childhood. And that's why I think it's, it's so important. I, t- I have this conversation a lot with parents, with kids is I'm always like, I don't have any kids, but from what I've learned from talking to like experts on parenting and just talking to people who I know who have kids, it's like, you got to be a parent first, like parent first. And then like, if you're in the health and wellness space, like that comes like second and far down the line second. Yeah. Because I think a lot of times what happens is these lines get blurry very quickly. And now it's like, you don't see your, your parent as your mom that you're your dad. You see them as like your coach or your nutritionist. And I think that is where it can create like some unhealthy or toxic relationships with food, because it's like your primary give caregiver, the person that you are getting the most love from specifically as a little kid, it's a lot of it's coming with certain expectations, right? Certain things attached. I think parents too, it's, it's, harder than ever these days, just because of our current food landscape. 
And a lot of parents are concerned about the health of their kids for real. I mean, I had, I was hired by one of my parents' friends. I mean, this was like five or 10 years ago now, but they were so concerned about their daughter in high school because she had gained a very significant amount of weight, like probably like a hundred pounds in a year. And they didn't know what to do because they didn't want to make her feel bad because it wasn't about, it was not about the, the cosmetics of it. It was not about the way that she looked. They were genuinely concerned about her health. And that's a real concern, but it's a tricky subject and it's hard to, to navigate that. It's a really hard subject to navigate. And I think this is a good segue into something else I wanted to talk to you about is that I think like the nutrition problem, the health problem we have now is so multifaceted. It's so layered that I don't think it's as simple as saying, all right, you just need to, to eat less, or you need to eat more protein or drink more water. I think it comes back down to to habits and helping to instill people with some level of self-confidence to continue to make the first step in getting healthy. And I also think it comes back to like us in the nutrition community, like doing a better job of, of getting along. And then also maybe like giving people some answers. And, and so my example is like, all right, the vegan diet didn't work for you. And it, it can be very challenging for a lot of people, but it can be done right. Like here, like if you really are want to follow a vegan diet and be healthy, like here's what you need to eat. Here's how much iron you need to have. Here's where you can get it from. Here's how much protein you need. Here's how much this and that on the flip side, like keto, like if you want to go keto and you want to do that, like, here's how to do it. If you want to do it instead, I think we just see wars like all the time. Like, no, my diet's better. No, my diet's better. No, my diet's better. And nothing gets accomplished. The problem gets worse. So in your opinion, like, what do you think we could do a better job of in the nutrition space and the nutrition community to help the people that are following us actually get healthier? I think first and foremost, that experts need to be reiterating this and people consuming the information from these experts also need to understand this, that at the end of the day, we're all bio-individual and what works for me may not work for you and vice versa. I'm living proof of that. I've been through basically every diet you can possibly imagine because you know, in my 20s, like I said, I did plant-based. I tried keto for a while. I tried paleo. I've tried basically all of them. And at the end of the day, like I can be, you know, listening to some doctor on Instagram saying the keto diet is the only way it's the healthiest way to go for every single person, but it didn't work for me. I could barely exercise. I could barely do anything because I had no energy. I was so fatigued. I learned that personally for me, what works best is I, I still need carbohydrates, but I need them on a, a lower level. And what we need to be encouraging people to do is to try everything, try the vegetarian diet try the carnivore diet, try keto, try whole 30. Like you need to experiment with all these different diets and then take note of it and figure out what works best for you. Like what diet made you feel like you weren't deprived? I mean, the way that I eat now, I never feel deprived. I never feel the need to like, you know, binge on quote unquote unhealthy things. I allow myself to have, you know, a cookie or whatever it is that I want that day. And I feel very satisfied with every meal. And I'm not I have a good amount of energy. I don't feel like I'm starving 24 seven. Like there's all these things that you can start to note and really take notice of as you're trying these different diets and then figuring out what works best for you. And what I hate is that we've gotten so diatribe where, like you said, we have, you know, the vegans saying that their diet is the best and that it's the best for every single human on the planet. It's just not true. And it's the same thing for carnivore. It's not the best for every person. Like you got to figure out what works for you. Right. Like, I think there's some common themes, I think, amongst all of them, which I think people need to be sharing about more. And like, in my opinion, I'll let you know, give your opinion. So like, in my opinion, the common themes that I think work are diets that are like high in fiber, high in protein, like have an adequate amount of fat, both from all forms. But like, obviously, I think just not like overdoing it on saturated fat, not anti-saturated fat. And then also just adherence, like doing like what works for you. I think what I've learned from my experience, just talking to others, like the people who have the best luck with certain dietary patterns and their overall health over the long term, it comes back to doing what works best for them, which is kind of what you touched on. So like, what are, in your opinion, like what are some of the common themes in all these nutrition approaches that you think people should pay attention to? Yeah. I mean, I would say first and foremost, get back to eating a diet of whole real foods. The problem is, is a lot of us are eating food and packages now out of convenience and stop eating fast food. You know, like that really is out of everything else. It's less about it being vegan, vegetarian and carnivore or whatever. And it's more about that. We are not eating 
as we are intended to eat in nature. And that is whole real foods that are not in packages. I tell people I have a couple of different little like rules that I use. One of them being, if your grandmother wouldn't recognize what you're eating, then you probably shouldn't be eating it. And if you're going to the grocery store and you're, you are looking at a packaged food because there are some packaged foods now, like there's brands like Siete and these organic brands that are making good, high quality foods. Simple Mills is another one. If you were to look at that ingredient label and you could technically buy all of those ingredients that are on the label in the grocery store while you're standing there, like you recognize everything. You're like, oh yeah, I know what this is. Like rosemary, almonds. Okay. Like I could buy this then it's fair game. But if you're looking at like, you know, a box of cereal and and you're like, what the hell is TBHQ and where would I even buy that? Put that back on the shelf because that is a hyper processed food with ingredients in there that were not meant to be consumed by humans, especially on such a large scale like we are now. And I agree with you. I think the less processed foods we can eat, the better. I think the the issue in my opinion is that it's very like, idealistic to think that way. And I think you're right. I just think it's so hard for people because when they hear like, all right, cut out processed foods or eat whole foods and they're eating hundred percent processed foods. Again, I think it comes back to, they get so overwhelmed and they're like, well, where do I start? So with that, like, what are a few like easy wins for somebody? Let's just say they're listening to this and they're eating a lot of processed foods and they don't have the confidence. They don't have the budget. They don't have the tools to just cut it all out. Like what are a few simple things they can do? Okay. Let me think. Yeah. Cause I mean, you're right. I think I will push back a little bit and say that I don't think that it's not available and accessible to most people. Like I, I realize, and I want to recognize and say that there are people that live in food deserts and that is a real issue and concern that hopefully we will be able to eradicate within the next five to 10 years. Outside of that, most people have the ability to go to the grocery store and put back the box of Cheerios and get red meat instead. And a lot of it comes down to if you are really on a budget, start thinking in a way of what foods am I going to be able to get that will have the most nutritious value for me? And I would say foods like that are ground beef. And if you don't have the money for the organic grass fed beef, that's okay. I'd rather you still be eating ground beef. And I would much prefer you to do that over the box of, I don't know, hamburger helper or whatever it is. And another great example is instead of buying those Cheerios, save that $5 and buy a carton of eggs and have eggs every morning for breakfast. It's really making these little swaps and, and trying to really make your money work for you in the most nutritious bang for your buck that you can get essentially. And I would say those are little wins. And for people that are or nervous about cooking. I know that's a real thing as well, but I think it's safe to assume that most people have access to a cell phone, which means they have access to the internet. And we have so many resources available to us now. You can pull up a YouTube channel where someone can show you something as very basic as learning how to fry an egg or learning how to make rice. Rice and beans is another great one if you're on a budget. If you put rice and beans together, they create the full amino acid profile, which is all the amino acids are the building blocks for proteins. So if you're really on a budget, you could do beans and rice and get a little like Mexican seasoning packet to add seasoning in there. Don't be afraid to use salt, by the way, as well. I think a lot of people going on a health journey think that they have to not salt any of their foods. The majority of the bad sodium that we're getting in our diets is from packaged foods. So if you're not eating a lot of packaged foods, I use salt very liberally on my food and it makes it taste better. And then you're going to want to eat it because it tastes better. It's healthier for you. Yeah. I would say that's kind of where I would start. And I also, Doug, it's a huge misconception that eating fast food is cheaper for you. So my producer and I, on my podcast, we started this series called organic for everyone. And what we started doing is we would choose a really popular fast food item. So one of them was the cheesy gordita crunch at Taco Bell. And we bought a meal of, I can't remember how many it was for Taco Bell. I think it was a meal for two at Taco Bell. And then we went to a very accessible grocery store. Like, I don't remember where we went, but we always made sure that it wasn't like Whole Foods. It was just like a Vons, Albertsons, whatever, where every majority of people have access to. And we bought every single ingredient to make that meal at home. And everything was organic. And it was cheaper for us to make organic cheesy gordita crunches at home than it was for us to buy them from Taco Bell. So a lot of this too is it requires a reframing in the mind that 
we need to stop spending so much money eating out because it's actually way more expensive, especially when you think about having to tip the waiter, tax, everything else versus like making a meal at home. And then you're going to have leftovers that you can then eat the next day. Right. Well, yeah, that all makes sense. And I think you're sharing some things that I think are important for people to hear. And, and I think that's on both sides. What happens is you'll hear like people in the vegan community say like, just cut out all meat. And it's like, all right, yeah, that's tough. like you, you say that to people. And like, do I think that eating red meat all day and like tons of saturated fat is healthy? Like, no, I, in my personal opinion, I, I think there's tons of research that supports that it's not, but it doesn't mean that red meat is unhealthy. Right. And I think with that said, I don't think it's healthy to be hyper-focused on any like one metric of your health. I think totally. you have to kind of like pull back the onion a little bit and look at everything. And I think outside of like demonizing certain like types of foods, like I wrote a post and I was just like, this is all terrible health advice. Fat is bad. Red meat is bad. Fruit is bad. Like all these things that are carbs are bad. Cause I'm just like, this has created like disordered eating patterns. I think amongst so many people where, I mean, I've had clients throughout the years that are like, oh my gosh, I can't eat blueberries because it has sugar in it. Or oh I can't, gosh. right. I can't yeah. eat peanut butter because it's got too much fat. I got, I can't eat. It's all like on a scale. Right. And it's all like, if you eat like four tablespoons of peanut butter a day, is that too much fat? I mean, it might be, I mean, depending on your goals, right. You're depending on your calorie intake and depending on, there's a lot of things it depends on just like red meat. Totally. Like if you eat like a pound of, of steak a day, like, is it going to be bad? I don't know. It depends on how many calories you're eating and your goals. Like I just think it, you're right. And it's individualistic for so many people. And I think that people sometimes people end up like missing like the simple things where they end up not making these small changes. And that's like going back to like, I guess how we even got on this discussion, this, this part of the discussion is like, you talked about making the switch from hamburger helper to like ground beef, you know, stuff like that, which I think is a great change for people to make because yeah. it doesn't deprive somebody of a food they like to eat. They're getting like protein in, they are saving some money. And I think a lot of other things can be done along those lines with like different cereals and, and different like, unhealthy vegan options that we see as well. Like one of the things that I think doesn't get talked about nearly enough is exercise for like health. Like we see so much about diet. We see so much about nutrition and fasting and this, we don't see hardly anything about like just exercise, move more. And I think your health will improve. Like what's your relationship with exercise? Like now you talked a bit about like where it's been, like, what's it like now? Like, what do you do for it? And how does it help your health? Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple of things I want to say. I want to wrap up just the end of that conversation really quickly and say that I don't think that there's enough of an emphasis or conversation around intuition when it comes to our food. And I know this may sound a little woo-woo to people and it takes a certain level of health to get to this place in the, in the first place. Cause I would say someone that's on the very beginning of their journey and they're still very addicted to the highly palatable, super addictive, you know, processed food products and everything. They're going to be more driven by cravings than they are like by their intuition. But we forget that biologically, I mean, we're animals and we have this innate system in here that tells us really what our bodies need. And I was just thinking about how, when you were talking about, you know, how people are saying, oh, I can't eat blueberries because of this, or I'm concerned about this serving of peanut butter or this serving of steak or whatever. And I mean, I can tell you that I'm a person sitting here that is very much driven by my intuition now. And I can't even really explain it to people. Like I can't say, oh, well, I eat this amount of ground beef every day. It's dependent every single day, depending on how I feel. And I'm very tapped in and in tune with my body and what my body needs. So that being said, I think that's a really important component of health. And we forget that since the dawn of time, we've been driven by our intuition because we're animals. And then to go into exercise, I would argue the opposite. I think that there's too much emphasis put on exercise. I mean, I think about there was that very famous thing that came out. It's like, I don't even remember now. It was probably like five or 10 years ago now, but where Coca-Cola paid for this study to say that you just need to exercise more and it's not sugar sweetened beverages that are causing the obesity epidemic. And of course it's not just Coca-Cola, but I think we can all say that sodas are very much driving our obesity epidemic right now, especially when Barack Obama was in office and Michelle Obama had started that whole, I forgot what it was called. I think it's move more. It was like the move more campaign yes, or something. Exactly. And I don't know if a lot of people know this, they talk about it in a documentary and I can't remember which one it is right now, but 
in the very beginning of her starting that whole movement, she was actually trying to get people to move away from processed foods. But then the food industry, which is owned by just 10 corporations, actually it might be 11. I can't remember exactly. It's 10 or 11. The entirety of our food industry is owned by 10 to 11 different companies like Quaker Oats, General Mills, all of that, our entire food system. So the illusion of choice is an illusion when it comes to eating healthy and our food. And what happened was they got a hold of Michelle Obama and they were like, oh, let us sponsor this when we want to be a part of it. And they moved her and suggested her into making it more about movement and exercise. And as a result, then the rhetoric was, oh, you can eat whatever you want. You can drink all the sugar, you know, sugary sodas that you want, all the processed food, as long as you exercise more, you're just not exercising enough. And the problem with this is, is that yes, there is science to being in a deficit. Like you're going to lose weight if you are eating less calories than you are burning off. That is true. But there is so much more to the conversation than just exercise. And I would argue that it's really only when it comes to like your body composition, it's only about 20, maybe 20% of the real, of the meat of it, because what you're fueling your body on a day-to-day basis is what is ultimately going to feel your body built, put muscle on you. And obviously you have to work out in order to do that, but you need to be feeling your body with the right foods. And if you're not doing that, then you can't out exercise a bad diet. Now that all being said, there's tons of research to support that exercise is really good for us. It's really good for your heart. It's good to move on a day-to-day basis. It's good to get outside. If you have access to outside to go for a walk or a hike. And then you asked about me and my personal journey. And I just get outside every day because for me, that's one of my non-negotiables. I see it as it's kind of a multifaceted thing for me because I get vitamin D from the sun. I get to bond with my dog because I take him on long hikes every day, or we go on walks on the beach. I get nature. So it's kind of meditative for me. I'll bring friends on my hikes. And so I get that connection with friends. So for me, it's not only is it exercise and movement, but it's so much more. I agree with you. I think there's a lot of nuance to the calories in calories out. I mean, I actually just recently talked about that on a podcast that'll be coming out sometime soon where, I mean, yeah, is a calorie a calorie? I mean, yeah, I think by definition, a hundred calories is a hundred calories, but the quality of those calories all calories aren't created equal in the sense of their quality, right? Which I think is kind of reflects what you just talked about. My thing with exercise and why I think it's so beneficial, it's not just the physical benefits. It's like the mental clarity, the emotional benefits. I think it's also, it's like a it's a low hanging fruit. I think you see a lot of people that can easily exercise, but they still struggle to get their nutrition in order where you really don't see the opposite. You don't see people who aren't exercising and they just eat, they just eat well. Like, I mean, and so the reason I say that isn't to just say, don't worry about nutrition because you do need to worry about nutrition as we've kind of talked about in this conversation. I just think, and again, this is just my view that it helps people get a little confidence in themselves where, and I guess this is, this is purely like anecdotal, my own journey. But when I started to exercise and feel better about myself, I started to make other choices in my life that kind of reflected the healthy lifestyle I'd begun to, to embark on. So I just think it could be a great tool to just get people started in moving like the right way. And I know that like for me, when I was eating super healthy and on this healthy track, which I'm still on now, I'm just not nearly as obsessive as I used to be. It impacted my relationships. I was like afraid, like I said, I said this on your podcast, I was afraid of like going out on dates. I was afraid of like going out to parties because I was like afraid that if I ate something that wasn't on my plan, that I would just end up going off the rails. Like how has has your relationship and the, the way that you live your life has it impacted your other relationships or have you just gotten to a place where the people in your life they're just all reflective of how you're living day to day right now that's a great question there's been different iterations of this throughout my life i oh and i, I wanted to say one more thing about the exercise it's very therapeutic for me and great for my mental health. And that is one of the reasons why I do it. So I completely agree with you. I think more than anything else, the benefits you get for the mental health aspect of it are very important. But um, yeah, as far as like with my diet and it affecting my relationships. So yes, there was a time when I think a lot of people probably go through, it sounds like you went through this. I think a lot of people, when they start on their health journey, they tend to go a little bit more extreme because they're trying to find that pendulum balance, you know, and, and Mm -hmm. you just naturally swing very far one way as you're trying to figure that out. 
And there was a point in time when I would reject going out to eat with friends because I was concerned the food wasn't organic or not cooked in the right oils that I, you know, that I wanted to consume. Or I would show up later to parties having already eaten dinner. And it wasn't in this like, it wasn't like an eating disorder way. It was more of just that I was trying so hard to control whether or not the food that was going into my body was organic. And I finally hit a point one day where I was like, I've got to stop doing this because this is not healthy for me mentally. Because then I was eating meals alone and missing out on all of the like social aspects. And there's a lot of research out there that eating with people you love is actually really beneficial to you. And the food can actually be more nutritious for you, dependent on like what your setting and surroundings are with your social experience. So I stopped doing that. And I've just gotten to a place where I've realized that, you know, I can control the groceries and the food that I bring into my house. And I'm very careful about buying organic. And then I go out to eat and I still have fun and I enjoy my time with my friends. As we bring the conversation like near towards a close, like I guess one of the things that I'm interested in knowing from you and maybe some people listening to this might be interested in knowing from you, given that we've kind of talked about how you've gone from like one end of the spectrum to now the other end. And you've kind of found your your ground with having a healthy relationship with food. Like what's one thing that Courtney Swan, like when she gets stressed or when you really want to have something that's maybe you wouldn't want people to see you eating, let's just say, like, what's that, what's that one thing that you still crave? <laughs> oh my God. I wonder, let me think. I mean, it's really, I guess it's such a reflection of my diet that I can't even like think of it. I don't really know that there is anything like, I guess I would say that the times that that happens are when I'm out to eat with friends. So let's say like, I'm very grateful that now I'm in a time in my life where where the majority of my friends want to go to healthy organic restaurants because that's just who we all are as people. Like we just are really striving for healthy diets. But if I do find myself out at like, Oh, I will say my weakness is when I'm at a Mexican food restaurant and they put the chips and salsa and guac in front of you. Oh my God. I can't stop eating them to save my life. So I would say that in French fries. I'm the same with French fries. And I don't deprive myself. If someone orders French fries or on the table, I will absolutely eat them. Oh my God. I love French fries at the branch. <laughs> so I guess I would say, yeah, the, that would be my chips and guac and French fries dipped in ranch. There you have it. Courtney Swan with the uh, <laughs> chips and guac and the French fries with ranch. Well, Courtney, this question. is this has been awesome. I'm glad that you came on the show. I'm even more glad that we were able to have this, I think, just thought-provoked discussion for both of us on the topics of health, wellness, nutrition, because I think it's going to, to help a lot of people and people are going to feel more connected to you. So if people want to connect with you, if they want to listen to your podcast, if they want to follow along on your journey, like where's the best place for people to find you at? Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed this conversation. I like your questions a lot. They're very deep and thought provoking. So thank you for that. Yeah. So for everyone listening, my company is called Real Foodology. So you can find me on Instagram at Real Foodology. And my podcast is also called Real Foodology. And that's where I spend the majority of my time. Sweet. Well, I will make sure to include the links to that stuff in the show notes. And for those listening, what I invite you to do is to share a takeaway. Maybe it was something that Courtney said about her own journey with health. Maybe it was something that she said about some simple steps you can take to improve the quality of your nutrition. Or maybe it was something that she said about her relationship with exercise and where she's at right now with it and why she finds so many therapeutic benefits um, and mental health benefits with how she moves her body today. Whatever it was, tag Courtney and tag myself because we'd love to hear your feedback. And we once again, thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bopes. We'll see you next time.